Okay, welcome to lecture 12. This is the final lecture. Um, and I'm actually not going to go do all the slides in this lecture. Um, I'm going to give them to you just for supplementary stuff. But um, uh, the last slides are, are very complex and just confusing. You don't, you don't need to know them. Um, and if, if you're curious, that you know, there's a paper. You can read it to, to understand them. But there's, there's only a certain part of this lecture I want you to understand. Um, and th this is a very important lecture. It's about how to actuate these things. So actuate flexures and compliant mechanisms. That's uh, very relevant, OK? So um, OK, so um, first, let's look at uh, static actuation space. So um, you remember this flexure here. Um, it's a parallel system. We designed it so it would achieve this freedom space, OK? Uh, we, you know, we assumed the topology's ideal constraints, infinitely stiff along their axis, infinitely compliant in the other directions. And uh, we used constraint space, and we laid out these flexures. And that, that gives us a good topology um, that, if they were ideal, would you know, not permit any motion, relative motions between these two outside of that freedom space. But in that freedom space, any rotation through there could rotate with no resistance. Okay? And, and we knew it would, it would achieve that. Um, you know, uh, you know, perfectly for the very first instant, right? Um, right, or at least that, that's how it's that's how it's designed. Okay, but the question is, where do you push on the darn thing? So, so say so, and, and now it's no longer ideal. Like so, so, so we, say we're actually assuming this has a certain thickness and width and length, and we've given it a mass, and this is actually a real mechanism, and that's its real freedom space. Say you wanted to actually access this rotation in the freedom space, right about the tip of that probe up there. So there's, there's like a sharp tip probe up there, and you want to achieve all those rotations in the sphere. Okay, But, but say you want to achieve this particular rotation. Well, um, it's within the freedom space, and you know there's some place you can push on it to get that for the, at least the very first instant to be exact. But um, you don't know the place to push on it. Right? Well, you might think, well, sure, I do. I'll just, you know, it makes sense. I'll extend something on here, and I'll pull up here or push on below, and we'll get it. And, and sure enough, if you do an FEA, um, it, it's pretty much rotating around that axis, and it always will because we've designed the flexures well. The flexures are designed well to, um, uh, you know, pretty much achieve what the freedom space uh, is, is laid out to do with, you know, very high approximation. Problem is, though, um, it's actually not rotating exactly where you want. It's an offset, even for the first instant. And you'll see if it's, if it's not quite the rotation you want, if it's offset, even for the first instant, you'll get, um, you know, you'll, you'll get an error. So here's the axis. It's actually rotating. That's the intended one. And, and this, this point will, will get an error. And that's even for the very first instant. Um, that, that means you know, because of where we pushed on it, we did not push on it on a place where you know, we push on a place where it'll approximately do it. The flexures do a good job of guiding it. But um, at the very first instant, it will rotate along the wrong line. And over large deformations, that'll drift. So that's not good. Um, so the question is, um, well, where do we push on it then? It, it turns out there's only one correct place to push on that stage to get it to move. So for the very first instant, it rotates exactly around the line in the freedom space that you wanted. It's like, well, gee, one spot of all places to load that stage. And how do you load it? What location orientation? How, how do you find that? Well, I'll tell you to find it in a minute. But it turns out the correct thing is, is a, a pure force wrench, a pure load, uh, you know, a very specific distance down here to the, to the extent that it requires that we build an extension onto the stage. So this is not connected to the ground. This is, this is floating. This right here is floating off of this, but it's connected directly to this stage. Right, so it's an extension of that stage, and we're pushing on it there. And apparently, that is the only place you can push on that stage with you know quasi setting nice and nice and slowly, you know, infinitesimally slowly, on that stage. So that the very first instant, it will purely rotate around the line you want. Now, of course, still, if we keep pushing over large ranges, that axis of rotation will drift, and you'll you'll still get a parasitic error. But at least for the very first instant. Um, the infinitesimal motion, that force is the best place you can push on it 
to get it to move that with no parasitic error. And consequently, even with parasitic error, it's the best place to push on it. It'll have the least parasitic error. Okay, so, so there is an optimal, a single best place to push on it to achieve the motion you want, okay, within the freedom space. Okay, well, all right, but okay, so that, that's the force that links to that, and I still haven't told you how to find it, I'll tell you in a minute, but what about all the forces that link to all of these, right? Like, you know, so it, it, it makes sense that if, if this single one links to that single force, there must be, since there are an infinite number of rotations here, there must be an infinite number of other forces that when pushed on this stage, you know, quasi-statically, very nice and slowly, um, it will access all the things in the freedom space with no or minimal parasitic error, the, the best case scenario. And, and that assumption is correct. Um, and if you draw all those blue lines where each one corresponds to these, they will all lie in an infinitely large plane that's the same distance. So that blue line lies on that, uh, that's, that's, that's that distance down. And it's a very specific distance down. So that means, you know, now sure, there's forces on here that, um, you know, don't even intersect the stage. So that's problem number one. But if we could draw an extended tab from this over here, push on it there, that means that would be the best place to push on it to access one of these red lines in this diagram. So any force I pick on this plane, um, if I could draw, have an extension come from that stage so I could push on it, it would map to a single uh, rotation in this freedom space that would, would cause it to move with minimal or no parasitic error. Okay? So this space that contains infinite loads, just like this, you know, to map to each of the infinite rotations in this, this space, is called the actuation space. And it, more specifically, it's the static actuation space. It's, it's the best place to push on it if you're pushing on it um, basically quasi-statically, like very, very slowly. Like, so like it takes an eternity to push it a, a centimeter or something, right? right? So super, super slow. Um, or for all intents and purposes, just slow, okay? So it's the static actuation space. And it's, it's a space that represents um, the best locations and orientations where you need to put your actuators to drive um, the, the, the motions of the uh, freedom space. Okay. Okay. So how do you how do you find this? How do you find an actuation space? Well, um, you already kind of know how to link a twist to a wrench, right? Um, and it's just with the stiffness matrix, right? Um, remember from Newton's equations, load minus so F minus K X equals mass times acceleration, um, and there might be a damping in there. If acceleration and, and damping speed go to zero then it's just F equals KX for quasi-static scenarios, right? So, so uh, Newton's equation just tells you if you quasi-statically load something with no other external forces, no gravity, anything, you just load it and the only thing that resists it is the spring, then, um, and, and you do it very slowly so there's no accelerations, no velocities, it's just a, a, a quasi-static displacement, then F equals KX. That's what F equals KX means. I mean, see, see my video about that um, uh, on, on YouTube. But this is, this is the wrench uh, twist version, um, and you know how to find a twist wrench stiffness matrix for this and any parallel system, okay? So here's a, here's a, it's a parallel system, two rigid bodies directly connected to each other. You can find the twist wrench stiffness matrix for that. It's gonna be a six by six matrix, okay? And so all you do is you take whatever twist you want within a freedom space and times it by this and you'll find the, the, the mapped wrench that needs to push on that, okay? And, and by the way, because it's quasi-static loading, the shape and size of the stage don't matter, so you can build as many extensions as you want. That, that only comes into play when you deal with damping and mass. But of course, because there's no accelerations or velocities, uh, you know, those things are irrelevant. You don't, you don't use them. It's just, it's, it, when, whenever you're driving something quasi-statically, non-dynamically, you don't care about the mass of, or the shape of the stage. So you, you can, cool things, you can shape this any way you want as long as you slowly load it. And, and I, you can use this equation to calculate. Of course, it won't change the stiffness if you change the stage because we assume all the stiffness is in the, the springs, the, the wires. Um, and so you can make sure you load it how you want, okay? And then if you want to find the whole actuation space, um, what you can do is, you know, you ask yourself how many degrees of freedom are in this freedom space? Well, you know there's three, so pick three independent twists within that space, 
or if you don't know that, you know, pick a ton and do Gaussian and Lewis, and you'll find three are independent, and, and put them in a matrix and times that by that stiffness matrix, and you'll generate, you know, another matrix of three independent wrench factors that you can linearly combine to generate this space. So it's, it's very simple, right? Um, and, and then now you have this space. Now, here, here's a couple insights, first of all. So insight number one, um, you know, if you have n degrees of freedom in a freedom space, the constraint space is going to be 6 minus n equals uh, the number of independent, you know, equals m, which is the number of independent wrenches in the constraint space, right? So n is the number of degrees of freedom, m is the number of independent wrenches in a constraint space, and they're related by 6 minus n equals m. Okay, according to uh, Maxwell's equations, and I think you, you prove that in a homework, why that's the case, okay? It just comes from linear algebra and the fact that uh, um, twists and wrenches are six by one components and understanding uh, linear algebra, essentially. So, but, uh, you know, you'll see the proof of that posted in the homework. But, um, but, but so, so anyway, so the, the number of freedom and constraint, you know, independent things in freedom and constraint spaces is, is never the same unless there's three independent things in each. It's in the third column, right? Then they're the same. Otherwise, they're not. It's always 6 minus n equals m, right? But for actuation space, you'll always have the same number of independent wrenches as twists in the freedom space, which makes sense because, you know, if you have three degrees of freedom, you're going to need three actuators. If you, need, if you have two degrees of freedom, you're going to need two actuators. If you have one degree of freedom, you need one actuator. One actuator per degree of freedom. So, um... um so, so there's not like a nice, clean, mathematical way to link constraint spaces with freedom spaces. Um, uh, th there, you know, there was, uh, Jinjun um, Yu uh, wrote a paper that was very interesting about uh, finding a nice, clean way to link actuation spaces with uh, freedom spaces. Um, but there are some assumptions that have to be in place for, for that to be, to, to be true. The, the most general way to find it is there's not a nice, clean thing like you know, omega dot delta t equals zero, which is the relationship between freedom and constraint spaces, basically the null space. Um, these can only be found by finding the twist wrench stiffness matrix, you know, and, and that requires not only a knowledge of its topology, but also its geometry and material properties and all this thing, okay? Um, okay, so, so, but, um, so anyway, um, so that's how you find the twist wrench stiffness matrix, okay? Um, or, sorry, no, that's not how you find the twist wrench stiffness matrix. That's how you use the twist wrench stiffness matrix to link, uh, to, to, to find uh, a, an actuation space for a given mechanism's freedom space, right? Um, so you have the mechanism, you have the freedom space. You need knowledge about both to find the actuation space. And, and it will tell you what shape it is when you linearly combine it and the distance, its location orientation through the math, right? Okay, so, so actuation space tells you a number of things, though. So it, it not only, it, it tells you the number of actuators you'll need to pick, right? And that'll be the number of degrees of freedom within the freedom space. It'll tell you where you need to place them, the loca you know, the locations and orientations. It'll tell you how you need to uh, align them so they're independent. You know, like, you know the rules. You can't just take all three actuators and make them parallel because that's not independent. Or you can't have them all intersect in the same point in the disk. So you couldn't put all three just pushing on the post so they intersect at the same point. That's a disk. You know that doesn't work. So, so it, it tells you basically from sub-constraint space rules how to pick them so they're independent. And, and they're all the same rules, right? because they're all wrenches. And then, um, and then it, it, it also informs you on how you need to shape your stage, uh, you know, so that the lines that you pick can pass through and actually push on the stage. So in this case, you needed to extend the stage at least down to the level of this plane so you could actually even push on them. And, and you may even need tabs as well. And, and then, uh, you know, it tells you when you pick the lines, you probably want them to be orthogonal attached so it's not pushing at some weird angle. So actuation space is really powerful. It tells you the number, kind, location, orientation. But yeah, by the way, I didn't say that on here. It tells you the kind. So when they're blue, um, you know, then you need linear pure force actuators in pushing a straight thing. If there are orange lines in the space, then you need a, a weird actuator that does a coupled wrench and torque. 
if, if they have a, a black arrow, or sorry, a black pure moment, which there would be in this actuation space here, uh, going up, you'd need a, you know, a, a, a rotary actuator that puts a pure torque on it. Um, and that, of course, would correspond with the rotation that's straight up and down. You'd need a pure torque on there uh, going straight up and down. Um, and all the other blue lines would map to all the other red lines in there. But, um, so it tells you the number, which is the number of degrees of freedom, the kind, whether it's blue, orange, or black, but the location, orientation of them, and how to pick them so they're independent, and then how to shape the stage. Which, And, and by the way, as long as you're quasi-statically loading it, like I said, the shape and size of the stage are irrelevant, so you can change it however you want. Okay? So, so in this case, we want to pick three. Okay? We want to pick them so they're nice and symmetric in some way, and, and so they don't all intersect at the same point or are all parallel. So um, probably the cleanest way to do that on this plane is pick them so they make a nice equilateral triangle. And, and to do that, you probably want to build extensions here so they can nice orthogonally push on it. And then you pick them and you define the wrenches. Okay? Wherever the coordinate, global coordinate system is, you define your pure force wrench vectors. You know they're pure force because it's blue plane. So you make the Q equal to zero. And you define it and you push on this. And, and now what you find is as you allow those pure force wrench rotors, so now, now you've located, you've oriented, you put them on the plane, you're pushing on the tab, you know, say you put your voice coils on there that are, you know, force-based actuators. I, I talked about force-based versus displacement-based actuators in the last, you know, in topic uh, uh, 10, I believe, um, you know, where like a lead screw is a displacement-based actuator. You don't know the force it's pushing, but the lead screw, you know how much it's displaced. Uh, whereas a voice coil is like a magnet in a, in a coil, um, you turn on the, the, the current and it, it, it drives the coil with the force. You don't know how much it displaces, but you know the force that's on it. This is force uh, control here. So say you put your, your voice coil on there, everything's positioned. Now the question is, what magnitude do you give this wrench? What force magnitude do you give these wrenches to get what things you want in there? If you once you place them, once you sweep through all the different magnitude combinations, you will get this stage to rotate around all the lines in the freedom space with as minimal error as is possible over as large a range as possible, right, um, because of how you place them. But what if you want to pick a specific twist in that freedom space? How would you calculate with these placed actuators, how would you calculate their force magnitude? F1, F2, and F3, that's the magnitude. Like, what, basically, what's the ratio of F1 to F2 to F3 where the magnitude of the force of these placed actuators is, how would you use that to calculate this twist? Well, you could use, um, uh, what you would do is you would put your wrenches that you've defined, um, as you've located them, you have, the, you have their location vector, their orientation vector, and everything, and you locate them and put them in this matrix, where you make sure their F vector you know, that's, remember in a wrench, there's the top three is F and the bottom three is the torque or the tau, right, um, the moment. You want to make sure that F vector, the top three, is a unit vector that points in the direction, okay, and, and uh, of all these. And, and you configure those wrenches and put them in a matrix here, uh, okay. This, in this case, it would be a six by three matrix called actuator, uh, W actuator, WA matrix. And, um, and then, you know, you would know, uh, well, first of all here, let me prove this um, to you. This equation. Okay, so, okay, I'm going to draw on top of this. This might look ugly, but um, so you can imagine if you have, okay, WA, which is, you know, that 6 by 1 or 6 by 3 matrix that contains the location orientation of all the forces you've, you've laid, the three forces you've laid, and you've, you've made sure the unit, there are unit vectors, you know, so it's like, they're like N, R cross N plus Q, N, you know, make sure those are unit vectors in the, in the wrenches. Okay, and this would be like, okay, but let's, let's erase that speedily here. So, so say you've stacked all those in there, you know that if you take F1, F2, and F3, which are now the magnitudes, and you times those, that will get, um, 
you know, assuming you know the magnitudes already of the forces to get that twist, you know that will get, um, that will be the stiffness matrix, Tw, times that T that you want, right? Um, because this, this is basically the linear, if you know the correct answer, this will be the linear combination of all those actuaries you laid that gets this, okay? So this is not a square matrix, this is a six by three matrix, and so if you want to invert this to solve for this, you would need to use uh, you know, this, this inverse equation. You, you, you'd want to multiply both sides by WA transpose, so you'd put it over here too. A transpose, okay, so now you make this a square matrix, and then you invert that square matrix and times it by that, and you get this. So you see, there's your T, there's your KTW, there's your WA transpose, and then times the inverse of that. Now you can solve for that. Now, again, this is a kind of a cheap inverse that, um, you know, if you're not exact, it, it'll give you the, mo the closest approximate answer. Um, but in this case, because you know, um, okay, because, so, so for instance, say, say I picked forces that were outside the actuation space, and I just pushed the three forces on this stage in some weird way, and built this matrix and did this exact same thing. I could, and, and this would tell me the best force combination of those guys to actuate this, this twist. But it would just be approximate. It wouldn't work. It wouldn't do the twist well. It would just be the best combination of forces. But because, um, you know, mathematically this will always work, right? But because I picked the three forces from the actuation space, and this is a twist from the freedom space, we're guaranteed that even though this is kind of that approximate, uh, in, you know, um, math approach, it will, it will give you the exact forces um, that can get this, this twist exactly. So this, the, you, you know, you can take this to the bank. You can use that and that'll tell you the force magnitude ratios to get any twist as long as you are typing in twist from the freedom space. Okay? And in this case, you, you don't even need to use this. You can actually just use common sense and symmetry and force balancing to find F1 is negative 2, F2 is 1, and F3 is 1. And, and you can see the moments force all cancel out and you get a nice uh, pure rotation where the first instant of rotation is exactly that twist from the freedom space. Okay? Okay, so... Okay, so here's the actuation space. Of course there's a finite number of actuation spaces because they're basically identical to constraint spaces. Constraint spaces, though, they're, they're wrenches that are blue and orange and black, and um, they represent the, the loads that the constraints use to constrain a stage. Um, but in this case, we're still using blue, orange, and black. We're, we're, we're finding it's still wrenches, they're still loads, but they're the actuation loads. And so, of course, to linearly combine them, they're going to look identical. Um, this, is, this is basically the parallel pyramid one from the constraint space, and it's the actuation space, okay? Um, it looks the same. We've dropped out all orange and black because, you know, most people just use linear actuators to, you know, linear forces to drive something. So it's, it's kind of more practical just to look at this. But if you did have an actuator that can put a pure moment on something or a coupled wrench with a torque, you could just look at the... Um, you know, constraint spaces with the orange and black things. Um, but, but, you know, this is the most practical. It's just linear actuators, parallel pyramid. Um, these all have enough blue things to, to, to you know, uh, to, to fill out the whole space, you know. Um, right, so, so, so remember, the things in the parallel pyramid have enough blue things in it so that 6 minus the number of degrees of freedom in their freedom space is M, and they have enough M things in there to, to fill out the space, remember? And so, so for instance, if you, have, if, you, if you want to actuate something with two degrees of freedom, these will at least have two independent blue lines in them. There's other actuation spaces, but they don't have enough independent blue lines in them, right? So, so okay, so that's why I use the parallel pyramid. Um, okay, so let, let's look at how this works. Um, this is very valuable um, because you really need to consider actuation space when designing things. Up to this point, we haven't considered actuation. It's just like, what's the degrees of freedom you want? What's the actuation, or what's the freedom space that maps to those degrees of freedom? 
then what's the constraint space, and then, and then synthesize it. And we, we didn't put any second thought about how you'd actuate it, but it's really important. Okay, so for instance, um, this one, say we designed it, and then we say, well, what's its actuation space? Well, what if it had been some super ugly space up here that d can't even push on the stage at some orthogonal angle and is really hard to fabricate? Well, then we'd probably want to consider a different design. But where we're lucky, this one had a really nice clean one, and it's, it's uh, case three type one, which, which means we, we've labeled this according to the number of actuators um, in the space, right? And it's nice and clean. So this is actually a nice actuation space, and it's a reasonable distance down. So it's like, well, maybe we did do a good design. Okay? But, and, and let's look at this one. Okay? So say here's, a, here's a flexure that achieves a, you know, two rotations and a translation. And, you know, it's got a, a, a plain freedom space. You know, the, the red plane with the black translation arrow, right? So we designed it, and we're happy with it and everything. But now let's look at its, its actuation space. Um, and a lot of these... You know, well, first of all, because it's three degrees, we're going to be looking case three. It's, it's going to be one of these nine, okay, if you want to actuate with just pure force um, wrenches. Um, and a lot of these, you can, like, you could calculate, you could, you could plug in the stiffness matrix, uh, you know, and, and calculate it, and then multiply it by all these twists and find the wrenches, linearly combine them. But, but honestly, with experience, you can just kind of look down your nine options and know which one it's going to be. The only one it really could be is this one going that direction, okay? And so, um, you know, and so, so, I mean, be careful with that. It, it, don't get too cocky. It's good to do the math and find it. But if you did the math, you would find it's this one, and it's really the only one that makes sense. Um, you know, you might be able to think, well, maybe a sphere pulled some distance down, um, you know, but, uh, but you'd find it would be this one, okay? And that's a beautiful constraint actuation space. You know, so it tells you it's a good design because not only um, is it a clean actuation space, but it's, it's like pushing right directly below so you can push on these tabs. So you just have the three tabs and put the actuators attached to those tabs. So it, it's, it's very actuation compatible. So this would be a, a sign that, oh, this was a good design. Okay, so like I said, you, you really have to consider the actuation space as a final step in the design approach, okay? So let me show you some things where you might be worried. So remember this one we built with our flexure kits, and um, this one, you know, achieves a two degrees of freedom, a translation and a rotation. Well, um, and it's a parallel system and everything, so um, you design it, say you're happy with it, and you're like, great, it does what I wanted, but let's see its actuation space now and consider it. So it's, it's only going to be one of these three options in case two, and which one is it? Well, um, it turns out when you do, um, uh, you know, the, the actuation space of the, or build the stiffness matrix of it, um, and times it by both of these twists, you get wrenches that when they linearly combine, end up being the disc. Okay? And it's interesting, no matter how long or thick or whatever these are, this, this plane is always halfway down the length of them. Okay? And um, it's some strange distance away that you'd have to calculate from the math. It's going to vary depending on what material it's made of and all these things. Um, but, but you calculate the stiffness matrix considering everything, and you times these two by it, and you generate two wrenches, and you linearly combine it, and it will, it will spit out a disk that's you know, halfway down some distance back. And this is interesting. It's, like it's, it's a clean, nice constraint space, but it's like, man... Um, this means it necessitates, if we like this design, like you have to realize we'd have to build a big extension that goes back and down and then mount an actuator from the ground onto here that pushes like that and pushes like that. Of course, if you push on that, if you had some L stage extension, you push on it like that, it would be the translation. If you push on it from the side, it would obviously be the rotation. But, you know, you'd have to extend the ground to mount the actuators and you have to extend the stage to have some L thing that goes halfway down and push on it. And that may dissuade you from doing this design. You may say, well, maybe this isn't the greatest design after all. Because even though it's a clean actuation space, it's, it's kind of far away and you have to have a long stage. Okay, here's another one. Remember, this was one of our tip tilt mirrors we designed. And, you know, of the parallel systems going through all the sub-constraint spaces, this was the one we liked the most because it had parallel planes. Or it, it had, you know, it was... It was um, symmetric about the tip and tilt uh, planes and so 
it, it basically has no parasitic errors or minimal parasitic error, error over large ranges. Um, but if we had, you know, of course we didn't like it. We went on to design a better uh, design where we got tip, tilt, and piston. 